OK, so we're going to go through Cisco SD WAN. Uh, one thing is if you have questions, uh, you can feel free to interrupt me. You can just take yourself off of mute and ask your question. If you're not comfortable with that, you can put it in the chat. And uh, it's hard for me, though, to monitor the chat while I'm also presenting. So uh, if I don't get to it right away, uh, I apologize. I'll take a break towards the end when we get ready to swing into the demo and take a look and see if there's anything I missed in the chat. Uh, I am going to stop my video just to make it a little easier. Okay. And uh, and we will have an introduction to the basic product, and then we'll do a demo. The demo is fairly brief. It's just meant to be a quick overview to show you the interface, which is all brand new. The interface is, is brand new and uh, less than a year old. So I've got a big upgrade recently. And uh, and then we'll just walk through how to do things like onboard an SD-WAN device into the fabric. And um, if we have time, we'll also look at what it's like to set a fabric-based policy. So with that said, we'll go ahead and dive right in. So this is just the agenda tonight. And like I said, it's not a death by PowerPoint by any stretch. We'll just talk about some of the ways that the WAN has changed over the last few years and how that's kind of driven us into SD-WAN. And then we'll start talking about some of the specific elements like templates, policies, zero touch, and then the demo. Okay. so. How has the WAN evolved? And, um, you know, if someone has a dissenting opinion, I'd be interested to hear it. But I think most people, you know, you might be able to make corner cases for this doesn't apply everywhere. But in general, we find that we have more users that are more diverse than ever. COVID just kind of accelerated that, which kind of plays into SD WAN, but on a a sidebar that we're not covering tonight called Sassy. Uh, but we have more users than ever before. And some of our users are coming from different locations. I've been doing uh, IoT stuff recently. So, you know, users that might not have traditionally connected to the network are now connecting to the network. And of course, there's expanding branches, work from home solutions, everything like that. Uh, more apps, but not only do we have more apps that we're supporting, but our apps have become more critical than they ever were before, right? Uh, I remember when I first started my career, it feels like 100 years ago, uh, there were a couple of apps and there wasn't much you could do to protect them or not protect them. You just, you just did your best to make sure that you had maybe dual WAN links if you could afford it or something like that. These days, not only do we have more and more apps, but the apps are more critical than they ever were. And the apps are no longer necessarily on-prem, right? So maybe you use something like Salesforce or ConnectWise or uh, Box.com or uh, you know SAP in the cloud or something like that. Um, all those items are Office 365. Right, all those things are apps, and they're not apps that you directly own or control anymore. They're apps that are in the cloud, right? And that's another way that our WAN has evolved is we no longer have all of our stuff, our thingies, within our nice little network. And then, of course, more threats. I don't think anyone could really argue this one. Um, maybe you can make an argument that they're, they're the same number of threats, just we're more aware of them. I don't think that's probably the case, but. Uh, you know, as we've grown our user base and as we've diversified our app portfolio, we've increased our threat landscape, right? And it's just a larger landscape that we have to cover these days. And I don't think there's a, a CIO or a CISO in the world that isn't highly concerned these days about what do they do when there's a breach. And a lot of times it's not if there's a breach. A lot of times these days it's when there's a breach. How are you going to react to it? 
and all that's plenty, but I'm betting anyone on the call who has any kind of operational experience in their background, whether they're operational focused or not right now, they're pretty aware that over time, we only have more and more demands placed on us. It's harder and harder to get outage windows. Uh, it's more and more vital <clears throat> that things stay up. And at the same time, budgets don't necessarily match that all the time, right? I think we're all probably pretty, pretty familiar with that. So these are some of the pressures, non-technical pressures that have kind of forced us to re-look at WAN you know, six, seven years ago, WAN meant usually MPLS or some kind of complex VPN solution if you couldn't afford MPLS. Uh, you know, the MPLS was very full featured, but very expensive for low bandwidth. The VPN solution was high complexity, but lower cost and possibly uh, fewer features or the features adding on the features layering on the features ratcheted up the complexity even more right and so that's uh something that's kind of driven us right so there's really uh six main uh pillars that we think about that have driven the technical adoption of needing to evolve the WAN. that's insufficient bandwidth this is particularly true as apps migrated to the cloud. I have a client who was all MPLS. They rolled out uh, Office 365. It was a little slow and annoying, but it was okay. But then they started doing calling through Office 365 and it was a disaster. And it, it was just, you can't keep using your low speed, uh, high latency MPLS links that go back to centralized data centers on a couple of continents, you need to let people get directly to the internet from the, the locations. Uh, fragmented security, right? I think we can all think about different ways that this impacts us. You know, do you have firewalls at the way and edge? Do you not have firewalls at the way and edge? Should you have firewalls at the way and edge? How do you deal with proxy based traffic? Things like that. The high cost of bandwidth, I mentioned if you came from an MPLS background or even before that things like frame relay or ATM or leased lines. Uh, some of my earliest WAN links were actually dial up modems, if you could believe that. So uh, all those were very high bandwidth as opposed to nowadays, if you order, um, you know, you can order a fiber connection for your business. You could get two or 300 megabits per second and it's not very expensive. It's a fraction of what an old 10 meg MPLS link used to cost, you know, but so much more bandwidth. Uh, limited app awareness. Uh, anyone who's spent any time doing QoS is kind of aware. You had to kind of know the IPs, the ports, and so forth of your applications. Again, that got really difficult when we started moving apps into the cloud and they may have dynamic IPs or they may be disconnected from our direct infrastructure and you now have a situation where the cloud provider could change IPs and you might not know it, right? Um, and then just in general, not being cloud ready, right? I kind of use that story of my customer, particularly in Japan, uh, they had a, a 30 offices in Japan and getting and making calls uh, via Office 365 is just, it was untenable for them. And then operations difficulty, right? Um, you have to, you know, you have to hire someone like me, to be honest, <laughs> which makes it sound bad for me, but, um, you know, someone who has a lot of experience on a CLI and can log in and maintain all those things. And it's very uh, prone to misconfiguration, right? Uh, everyone might do things a little bit differently. I do things differently myself over time. If I look at configs I was doing 10 years ago and I look at how I do them now, I think, oh boy, that's kind of cringeworthy, right? Uh, probably a lot of us have dealt with these kinds of challenges. So those are some of the ways that the WAN has evolved, both technical and non-technical, that have kind of pushed us towards SD-WAN. And SD-WAN is basically an internet first, but really any transport, internet, LTE, 5G, 4G, um, MPLS, you know, 
anything you have that could be a WAN link, it can work with the Cisco SD-WAN solution. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's talk about some of the key concepts that we're going to go over tonight. And some of these will kind of skip over, but they're important key concepts if you end up going down a path of Cisco SD-WAN. The first one is a site ID. Basically, each of your offices or locations gets a single site ID in the Cisco solution. This part is pretty unique to Cisco. And it's important that all WAN edges at a single site share the same site ID because we do a lot of things like setting policy based off of site IDs. And there's a whole, you could, you could spend a whole hour just talking about how to come up with the site ID. It's a, a multi-digit number. I can't remember exactly how many digits it is right now. I want to say it's nine digits, but don't quote me on that. And so there's a, a lot of different things. If you're familiar with Cisco CVDs or Cisco validated designs, uh, they have a great one uh, for SD-WAN that goes through different ways that you can define your site IDs to make applying policy based on site ID a little bit easier, depending on the type of company you're in. System IP, okay, so basically every WAN edge has a unique system IP. It's similar to a loopback zero interface, although it is different. This uh, system IP is particularly tied to your routing processes, kind of like uh, when you, you know, do a, a source interface for your OSPF or BGP process or something like that. So you can think of the system IP as that. Technically, it doesn't need to be routable. A lot of times people do make it routable and it doesn't preclude you from adding a loopback zero type interface to your router as well. In Cisco, there's this concept of color, which is basically just a WAN transport. And there are two types of colors. There's public cover colors and there's private colors. And these are important because they kind of define the services that we think are available outside of those uh, colors. You know, if it's a public color, there's certain capabilities that that color is going to have and if it's a private color, like say MPLS or site-to-site uh, -site link or something like that, there's different services that that might have. Under public and private, there's a bunch of kind of subcolors. I would say in the solution, this is one of my least favorite terms because the, uh, the colors aren't typically named after colors. It'll say something like a color might be called biz-internet, which isn't a color, right? Um, I think it, it would be better to call it WAN transport or transport type or something like that. Then calling it something like biz-internet would make a lot more sense, but it's just kind of what you deal with. There's a concept of a TLOC or TLOC. And this is basically a WAN interface identifier. It basically takes a combination of the color of an interface and the IP address of the interface and creates a kind of a hash based on that or a tuple based on that. And the T locks are used to be able to determine what transports you want to take. And um, if we have time and if someone can remember, because I don't cover this directly, you can do some things in SD-WAN that would never be possible in a traditional WAN we can take the T lock, which is again tied to a color, which is tied to a circuit on one router and actually extend it down to another router through a feature called T lock extension. <laughs> it's a little weird when you're first getting used to it, but it allows for a lot of really neat failover scenarios um, when maybe a WAN interface goes down, but an SD WAN router stays up or something. And then there's two basic sides to your SD-WAN routers themselves. There's the transport side, which is really just the WAN. That's where you have your color and your T-lock. And then there's the service side, and that's whatever is connecting to your LAN inside the office that you're working from. It could be layer two or layer three. There's no, you know, 
requirement that it be a layer three or anything like that. Um, it'll support either. So you have a transport and a service side. The default uh, on the transport is everything is in what we call uh, VPN zero. And uh, that means it's always all traffic that exits that WAN side or that transport side, it's always tunneled and, and encrypted no matter where it's going. As long as it's staying in the fabric, I guess I should say. And then on the service side, the default VPN there is one. You could add additional service side VPNs. If you do add additional service side VPNs, you can actually create unique topologies on a per service VPN basis. That gets a little complicated. Definitely not doing that tonight in the lab. Uh, although if that's something that you think you're interested in or something like that, it is something that can be demoed and it is pretty cool. It's just a little bit of a specialized use case. Not everyone needs or wants these multi topology WANs, but they are pretty neat and uh, we have used them for a couple of clients. And then if you don't take anything else away, take this away. When I talk about a VPN on Cisco SD-WAN, it's really, don't think of it so much as a VPN, it's really like a VRF. Although they do have VPNs, they do have tunnels, they do have encrypted uh, connections and everything else, you really wanna think of that VPN as a VRF. It's a separate routing table, right? And that's how we get things like advanced features like multi-topology VPNs. Anyone have any questions on these terms before I move on? Okay. Uh, sorry, quick question. The the infrastructure that the Steven is built on, does it use any of the conventional topology like BPG or uh, like OSPF or is it a completely total? Boy, that's a, so, okay. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And the, the, the answer is yes, meaning it does use those and it also uses some proprietary stuff. And we'll get into that uh, a little more in depth in a few slides, but the SD-WAN routers, they support most of your typical protocols. They support EIGRP, OSPF, and BGP. Most of my clients these days stick with BGP. It kind of simplifies things. I get some kind of AS path consistency, but uh, some really like to use OSPF. I don't have any clients, at least in SD-WAN, that are also running EIGRP, but it is supported. There's also a protocol that's proprietary to the solution called uh, OMP or Overlay Management Protocol. We'll get into that in a few slides. That runs, uh, that runs kind of on top of things and it's used for control plane communications within the solution. So the OMP is kind of the brains that determine how you're going to deal with tra traffic, whether you're going to have something that's full meshed or you're going to have something that's up and spoke or whether you're going to have uh, uh, certain policies or certain routes propagate in certain ways to certain sites. So OMP, it's a little hard to explain. It's sometimes easier to kind of demonstrate, although we won't go heavy into OMP tonight, but um, it's what gives you all the good flexibility within this but the two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they work kind of together. Does that answer your question? I believe that was, I don't Yes, thank of, you. Uh, Sahil, is it Sahil? Yes, correct, thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem, Sahil. Thank you, it was a good question. So let's talk about some of the common elements. And the first element we'll talk about is called V-Bond. And it's effectively the orchestration plane of the solution. Um, it will talk a little bit more about some of the specialized use cases of VBond when we do uh, when we go through zero touch provisioning. But effectively, this orchestrates the control and the management plane. It's the first point of authentication 
for your solution. And it's important to realize every step of the way that we go through here, everything is re-authenticated when you're first bringing something up. So uh, it keeps track of all the management plane components, some of these grayed out ones like the vSorts and the vManage. And it uh, also uh, takes that list of management components and it helps distribute them down to the WAN edge devices so that they understand how to get to the different components of the solution. Uh, it does require a public IP address and it is highly resilient, meaning although I have a single V-bond pictured here, uh, you can have multiple V-bonds. The V-bonds do not need to be super highly scalable though, because you typically only talk to the V-bond when your WAN edge is first coming online. And we'll talk about this more in depth with uh, the ZTP process, but effectively the WAN edge reaches out to the V-bond to say, hey, how do I go register with the SD-WAN fabric? It tells you, hey, go over here to the vSmart, for example, or the vManage. It actually drops the connection to the vBond and then goes and talks to the vSmart. The vSmart, as we're going to find out, is the brains behind the actual fabric. So you don't have a lot of persistent communication or connections going to the vBond. So why it's important that they be resilient and you always have more than one vBond, um, you don't need really beefy instances or anything because they don't see a lot of traffic other than when a WAN edge is first coming online and it, it's kind of bootstrapping itself. So the next item is the vSmart. The vSmart is uh, basically the control plane of the solution. So you don't have a you kind of have a read-only sort of control plane down on your WAN edge, which is very different from a traditional router, right? You can't just log into one of these WAN edges and start programming like VGP or OSPF or creating access lists. The control plane is actually locked out, and that's because all your changes are pushed through these vSmarts. The vSmarts will propagate the control plane information to all the WAN edges. Uh, which is what gives us a lot of our flexibility. Um, so what does it do? Well, it facilitates the fabric discovery. Uh, most importantly, it disseminates all the control plane information between the various WAN edges. Uh, it distributes the data plane and AppAware routing policies. We're not gonna go through App aware, we're not gonna we're gonna talk about policies, but I'm not gonna demo policies. It just takes a little bit too long. Um, well, we're gonna do actually that's not true. We are gonna do a small policy if we have time for it. I, I was gonna do a full mesh to hub and spoke. Um, we'll see how the time is looking. Um, so you deploy all your changes through the vSmart. These are highly resilient. There's uh, always a minimum of two. They can scale though up to 20 because these will handle consistent communications because they are the control plane. Every WAN edge needs to talk to at least two vSmarts for redundancy. Okay, so there is a lot of persistent communication and traffic that goes back and forth between the WAN edge and the vSmart. So uh, not only are these resilient, they need to be um, a little bit beefier. Now, by default, I should mention all these components that we're talking about right now, the vBond, the vSmart, and in a minute, the vManage, they can be on-prem, but they're more commonly put in the cloud. They're mo mostly cloud controllers. If you're a non-cloud company, and those are definitely out there, then they can go on-prem. There's some extra um, components to consider, like I mentioned, the vBond has to have a public IP, for example, you need to think how you're gonna do that. But um, it supports either on-prem or in the cloud. And then of course we have our edge. The edge could be um, 
these days it's almost always a Cisco router, like an ISR or an ASR, uh, or maybe a Catalyst 8K or something like that. There is, so Cisco first acquired this solution from a company called Viptela a few years ago now, maybe four years ago or something like that, I wanna say. There's not a ton of Viptela left, but Viptela did have some generic hardware of their own called V Edges. And I believe there are still a few V Edges left. I think you can still get maybe the V Edge. I think they end of life the 1000 and the 5000, but maybe the 2000 is still out there. Don't quote me on that. But it's basically just a router. It's just a WAN router. Most most of the most commonly these these days I see C edges, so like ISRs of some sort or another, right? Um, or in if you need high bandwidth or you need to be in the cloud, maybe a Catalyst 8K, something like that. So obviously this is providing your secure data plane from the remote WAN router. Just remember everything that's leaving the WAN edge across the transport is encrypted, right? It's all encrypted. So uh, I mentioned earlier, um, Sahil had, had mentioned like, is there any proprietary protocols or something? There is, it's called OMP. We're actually gonna talk about that in another slide, but OMP basically runs between these vSorts and these uh, edge uh, routers, uh, which is how we program that control plane. Um, when you create something like a data plane policy or an app aware routing policy, you push it out by the vSmart, but it's instantiated obviously down on the WAN edge, right? That policy, um, like if I redistribute OSPF in the BGP or something like that, that obviously has to be done down at the WAN edge, but uh, it's initiated up at the cloud management uh, specifically the vSmart. There are other policies we'll talk about that maybe don't apply to the WAN edge. They may apply to the, or they may apply to all WAN edges or many WAN edges. Those are called fabric policies. And last but definitely not least, because um, this, oh, I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, on the C edges or on the edges, um, these uh, these do fully support redundancy. So you could have one WAN edge with you know two power supplies. You could have two WAN edges on different transports. You could have two WAN edges that are fully meshed across all your transports. Um, they support all those sorts of things, including like you know first hop uh, redundancy protocols, all that sort of stuff. So uh, last, but like I said, not least is the vManage. When we start the demo, everything we see is gonna be, almost everything we see is gonna be vManage. This is the interface that you and I will go into as we administer this solution. So when we're creating configurations, we're doing it in vManage. Um, when we're onboarding devices or attaching templates, and we'll see what that looks like, we do that in vManage. So vManage is a giant database that basically runs and uh, it's your kind of single pane of glass for all your operations. Uh, it does support multi-tenancy if that's a requirement. Think of it as doing centralized provisioning via policies and templates. So we'll talk what, about what policies and templates are in a slide or two here. You also do a lot of your troubleshooting and monitoring here software upgrades, all those sorts of things. It has a fully um, programmatic interface, uh, RESTful API, and then it speaks NetComp down to the vSmarts, for example. So um, the vManage is also highly resilient. Um, it's a database and uh, its resiliency will always reside, if you do the, if you do the cloud-based management, the resiliency always resides in a different region. So let's say you have a nationwide company, they might put one vManage on the West Coast in AWS and the other vManage may go as a warm standby on the East Coast. 
of AWS, for example. Okay. Um, if you do the on-prem solution, they can't really force you to put it in two different geographic regions, but it's highly recommended that you do that. Um, so they are warm standby. So if the primary vManage fails, it will take about 15 minutes to get the secondary up. It's important to understand that does not impact flow of traffic whatsoever. During that 15 minutes, you cannot uh, instantiate any changes and you can't see any of the graphs or the web interface or the GUI, but uh, the vManage, no packets flow through the vManage, right? Um, so it doesn't impact, if it goes down, it does not impact the flow of information. Any questions on uh, the vBond, the vSmart, the uh, edge devices or the vManage? Okay. Here's the uh, second, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry just a uh, quick question. So I just wanna make sure that the vBond and the vSmart, are they, I didn't get them. Is it, are they like, uh, like a virtual machines running on the, on the edge or are they like uh, interfaces? I was not sure about that. Yeah, they're like VMs that run in the cloud, basically. Yeah, so uh, typically uh, I see them running in uh, AWS or Azure. They also can run in Google Cloud. They could run on-prem. Like I said, you don't have to use cloud management. If they run on-prem, I believe that they support, uh, I believe they support VMware only. I don't think they support Hyperflex or any of the other ones, or sorry, uh, Hyper-V or any of the other ones. So I believe it's VMware only for the image for on-prem. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yes, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so OMP, I mentioned this before, it stands for Overlay Management Protocol. And it's a TCP-based protocol that runs between all the vSmarts themselves, whether you have two vSmarts, you have to have a minimum of two, or whether you have 20, I believe you can have a maximum of 20 vSmarts. That'd be a very large fabric to have 20 of them. Um, and then it also runs uh, between all the WAN edge devices and those vSmarts as well. And you'll see every WAN edge here is depicted as having connections to two distinct vSmarts. This is for redundancy, right? And if the connection for some reason goes down to the first vSmart. Um, it will still have a connection to the fabric through the second vSmart, and it will work to reestablish, if not connection to the first vSmart, to an alternate vSmart. So that even if it loses a vSmart, it will do its best to add a redundant one in. Obviously, that won't scale infinitely, but it's pretty resilient. Um, Everything uh, going between these uh, controllers uh, in the OMP protocol, it is encrypted. It's inside a TLS or DTLS connection. And as mentioned before, it basically advertises uh, control plane context information down to your devices. So you program everything in on the vManage. The vManage pushes that to the vSmart via NetConf. And the vSmarts then take that and instantiate that policy down onto the WAN edges itself. Okay. And effectively, what OMP does is it dramatically uh, brings down control plane complexity, but it really uh, raises up the solution scale because I don't need to have any to any tunnels that are persistent between all these different devices. Instead, I only need tunnels to my vSmart, so my vSmarts will program my control plane and forwarding behavior to me. So I can still have the benefits of a full mesh without having to maintain, uh, without having to maintain full tunnel state, which would make it very difficult to scale. OMP also allows you to do some neat things 
in terms of policy that just would be impossible to do in a normal WAN. We can set uh, we can set policies on all sorts of different things. And that's because OMP is a little more object based rather than IP based. So you can create different objects like application awareness or something like that and base policies off of that as opposed to just uh, you know destination based routing, which would be our typical way of doing it in a traditional way. Let's get into the specifics of how things are configured. Every, all your basic configurations are done in items called templates. Okay. And we'll take a look at a template in the demo. We're not going to build one from scratch. I'm, I'm going to be very upfront and transparent. You'll spend a lot of time building out your templates. However, the nice thing is you, you do all this upfront work to build these templates. But then you find that your deployments and your turnups are very smooth and cookie cutter. There's very little, there's very little uniqueness after you've done your template. So there's a lot of upfront work and very little on the back end sort of work. So you build out these templates. There's two types, feature templates and device templates. Um, feature templates are exactly what they sound like. They are templates for individual features. If you want to configure AAA, that's a feature template. If you want to configure BGP, that's a feature template. NTP, that's a feature template, right? Those are all just little micro features. And so feature templates tend to be very plentiful. You're going to have a lot of feature templates, generally speaking. But they tend to be pretty simple as well. There's usually not a lot to them because it's only doing AAA or it's only doing your banner logins or something like that, right? There are a few gotchas when it comes to templates. Uh, I mentioned before, there's technically two types of edges, C edges and B edges. C edge just means a Cisco ISR or ASR. Um, these need to be separate templates. You can't take one template and apply it to both types of hardware. They're just not compatible. These days, this isn't as big a deal because B edges have really started going away for the last few years. Um, so it's much more common these days to see C edges only, which makes this not as big a caveat. Um, and the templates tend to be tied to a specific hardware platform. So if you have a bunch of 4331s, you'll have templates for 4331s. If you also have an ASR 1000, uh, HX or something like that at your data center, you have to have a different template for that. It is tied to the hardware platform, which makes sense if you think about it. The different hardware platforms will have different interface enumerations, things like that, different amounts of memory, storage, all those sorts of things. If you take a feature template and you try to genericize the feature template to multiple types of devices, you may get a problem where you get into least common denominator. This is a hard thing for me to kind of explain very easily, but on some features like triple A, the syntax is all pretty much the same and, and it doesn't become that big of a deal. However, if I've got like six different hardware types and uh, in my system template, which is has a whole bunch of system settings in it. It's one of the larger templates. Um, I may find that if I try to apply it to all six different hardware types, certain features may end up getting grayed out because it's like, oh, you know, the ASR 1000X platform doesn't support this particular feature in the system template, so you can't use it. The way to work around that is if, if you have a feature you need and it's being grayed out, take your feature template and break it into two and do one for, you know, hardware platform A and hardware platform B. So that's feature templates. So let's talk about device templates. You typically only have a few device templates. You have lots of feature templates, but relatively few device templates. Um, and they are usually built out after you've already done your feature templates. It's not a hard and fast rule, but basically the device templates 
aggregate all those feature templates up into one big master template. It's kind of like a template. The device template's kind of like a template of templates. And uh, you can kind of see what it looks like here. I have, a, I have a system template called FT for feature template, vEdge branch system. I have another one for NTP called FT vEdge branch NTP. For logging, I didn't create one, so I'm just using the factory default logging template, which will really be no logging. So um, you can see kind of how I will aggregate up my feature templates into a single device template. And, uh, and then you apply the device template to your devices, and that's how they get configured. So just some general recommendations when it comes to templates, because this is a lot of your upfront work. You want to come up with a naming standard for these templates so that they all follow the same naming standard. You can see like here is an example. I have FT for feature template. That means if it's a device template, it's going to be DT underscore something, right? Um, here you can see I've got a mixture of underscores and dashes. I don't think I did this because I, I can't stand mixing underscores and dashes, but someone did. Um, I would go one or the other, probably not both. But the bottom line is you need to come up with some kind of naming standard, okay? In the feature templates, there's three types of variables or values that you can set. The first one is the default uh, value or variable, and that just means whatever the default is in the template, just take it, don't change anything. Um, there's one called global, and this basically means I want to use the exact same value for every device that utilizes this template, okay? Um, so if you had a, if you had a particular setting, like let's say for AAA, and you only have two AAA servers to authenticate against for all your offices, or you could make the AAA template use global values because every site is going to use the same two AAA authentication sources, right? Um, and then you have local variables. And local variables mean that you need to enter the data on a per device basis, right? You're going to need a naming standard for your local variables as well. I use variables and values interchangeably, by the way, just so we don't confuse anyone. And so, what would be a local variable? Well, host name, that's a good example. We don't want all of our routers to have the same host name. You know, I probably want some combination of location, you know, geography, something like that, type of router maybe. Um, or IP address, obviously not all my routers have the same IP address, so a global value wouldn't be any good. Default value would probably be blank, so it needs to be local. And uh, when you're creating those device templates, they usually revolve around common features based on the WAN design. So for example, you might have uh, device templates that encompass all your data centers, or it might encompass all your branches that have an IGP on the service side, right? Or maybe some of my WAN branches have dual WAN and some have single WAN. You might do different device templates for that. So device templates tend to revolve around devices that can kind of be commonly um, linked with the type of architecture they have. Remember that because we have feature templates that take things like local variables, we're not locked out of, they have to look all cookie cutter. They're not all gonna have the same host name or the same IP addresses. It's just saying, okay, well, you know, maybe I have three classifications of sites. I have site type one, those are my large offices and data centers. I have site type two. Those are my medium sized uh, branches. And I have site type three, which are my small branches. And I might say, okay, site type one, I always have two WAN routers. I always have IGP running on the service side or the LAN side. Um, I always have uh, all transports hooked to all routers, whatever it is. And maybe site two, it's kind of like, well, I have all, I always have two WAN routers in my medium sites, and uh, they're uh, also running OSPF. 
and maybe my smaller sites, well, they only connect to the internet, right? Um, or something like that. And you can start to see some commonalities. Let's talk policies. Um, so what templates do for basic configuration, like IP addressing, host names, AAA, NTP, templates, or I'm sorry, policies, they do that for more advanced configuration. QoS, route redistribution, application aware routing, things like that, uh, VPN topologies. Policies get broken into two types. You could have localized and centralized, and they're pretty much exactly what you might think. A localized policy means that policy is localized to the device you attach it to, okay? So if you redistribute OSPF into BGP and you wanna write a filter, that's probably going to be a localized policy because I'm probably going to need to build a prefix list that's unique to that site or something. Not always, there could be exceptions, of course, but often something like that would be a good example of a localized policy. A centralized policy either will be applied to the entire fabric or possibly to multiple sites within the fabric. So if you wanted to configure something like application aware routing, or you wanted to set a unique VPN topology for the fabric that's based on the service side VPN. So for example, let's say all of my sites have both a, a private WAN link through MPLS and a public WAN link through internet. And I say, if you're in VPN one, you can do full mesh across both, but if you're in VPN 10, maybe you're a guest. And you, the only thing you can do as a guest is you can just go out the internet. You can never use the MPLS link under any circumstances. That's the kind of concept that we have of VPN topology, right? Um, and being able to do unique VPN topologies based on service side VPN number. Remember, a VPN is really just a VRF, and that's how we're able to accomplish those sorts of feats. Uh, this is just kind of a graphic that kind of explains the difference between localized and centralized policies and what some of these are. Um, this this uh, is being recorded, as everyone knows, I think, and it will go up on YouTube. So uh, in a couple of days, you should be able to just uh, go up to YouTube to LA Network's channel and uh, you can rewatch this, or if you email me, I put my email in the chat earlier, uh, you can email me and I'm happy to send you the slide deck directly if you would like. So a couple of things about when you're applying policies, there's different places that they could be applied. So like a data policy, which might be around something like uh, routing behavior, it may apply on both the LAN interface and the WAN interface. It might say something like, hey, on the LAN interface, I'm gonna take OSPF routes in, but I wanna write a filter. And on the WAN interface, I wanna summarize that and send it out looking like this. You could have something like an application aware policy. I could do something like, hey, if I'm trying to get to Office 365, even if, um, even if I have a really good route through my MPLS link, I want to take my I want to take my internet link because Office 365 is a you know I know what that app is I have an app inspection engine. Uh, Chris, I got a request from you. Did you have a question or something? That was probably just a mistake there. Okay, so app aware policies, those attached to the WAN interface only, they take effect as the traffic exits the local router and enters the fabric. And then we have things like control policies, that's things like advanced routing or VPN topologies. Those impact the fabric as a whole. There's actually a great uh, Cisco Live topic uh, or talk that you can go watch that is really dives into the different types of policies and how to build them. It is pretty in depth. It's not something you do just because you're interested, but if you're really looking at SD-WAN and you need to understand policies, that video is one of the best. 
Um, it's pretty easy to find if you just go to CiscoLive.com and go through the past uh, sessions. I think it was probably from the 2019 session. It was right before the pandemic kind of started. So uh, if you just search on SD WAN policies, you'll find the session. Oops. Okay, let's talk about onboarding through zero touch. And uh, you'll see this is a little weird. I have two V bonds. Let's talk about how this works. So to get zero touch, first of all, I get it that zero touch is a little bit of a marketing term. There is no such thing truly as zero touch. You have to have someone who at least plugs in power supplies and plugs in cables, right? So, um, but it's, it's about as close to zero touch as we could get, but it makes a couple of assumptions. The first assumption that it makes is that there is DHCP on the WAN interface and that that DHCP will also provide DNS access. So if you don't have that, if you don't meet that criteria, you can still take advantage of zero touch. It's more like one touch though, instead of zero. What it means is you need to pre-program your WAN edge with a static IP and a static DNS. And that DNS needs to be able to resolve public DNS. So here's what happens, assuming that you have met those criteria. Oops, I'm sorry. And we'll go through this in the demo in a minute. The WAN edge comes up, it powers up, it gets its DHCP address, or it's been pre-programmed with an address, and it gets its uh, its DNS information. That's step one. So it, it, it receives <coughs> its IP and DNS information. Step two is it reaches out to a internet publicly reachable VBON service, devicehelper.cisco.com. There's something similar for if you're a vManage instead of a C, uh, I'm sorry, if you're a V edge instead of a C edge. Different name, I believe, but same concept. And this first V bond, we sometimes call it, or at least the last thing I've heard it called most recently is the V bond to V bonds. Because what this V bond does is it says, okay, who are you? Authenticate yourself to me. And uh, it has a cert that's built in with a tamper resistant chip on it. It presents itself. It also presents things like its serial number. And all this is taken care of on the back end when you put your order in with Cisco, they pre-populate your serial numbers and stuff. And that V-Bond will say, oh, uh, your serial number is ABC123. You belong to XYZ Corp. Uh, I need you to disconnect from me and reconnect to this other VBond. This is why it needs to have a public IP address. Um, because that's your actual individual VBond for your corporation. So he drops this connection. He'll never talk to the VBond to VBonds again. Well, maybe I shouldn't say never, but he would rarely have a reason to talk to this VBond to VBonds again. So the third step is he goes over to his corporate individual V-Bond that is within my own environment. Again, I typically see it in a public cloud like AWS or Azure, could also be on-prem. He registers, he re-authenticates, and that's important. He's going to re-authenticate in every one of these steps. He talks to that second V-Bond, re-authenticates, and that V-Bond says, Okay, I believe you. I know who you are. You need to go check in with vManage. Okay, I want you to go talk to vManage and see what you should do with yourself. He actually drops this connection. And then his fourth step is he comes over here and he talks to the vManage. The vManage says, okay, everything gets re-authenticated again. And the vManage says, okay, um, now that I know who you are, let me see what I'm supposed to do with you. And this is what we're going to demo in the lab today. If you have pre-configured things, even before it's powered up, the vManage can say, oh, I know who you are. I recognize you. And uh, guess what? I want you to come up online and configure yourself. 
He then, he doesn't drop this connection to the vManage. Instead, he establishes a connection to the vSmart. He gets the vSmart information from the vManage. He connects into the vSmart. He re-authenticates again. And then the vSmart says, because there's a connection not drawn here between the vManage and the vSmart. There's always a, a net connection between vManage and vSmart. And the vSmart says, oh, I know who you are and I have your configuration template. Here it is. It uses NetConf to push that back down and this device configures himself. That's a lot of steps that we just went through, but you'll see it's actually pretty easy when we get into the GUI. Let me real quick show you what the lab kind of looks like. It's something like this. This is a very simplified version of it. But I have a data center that has two routers. I have a branch one that has two routers. I have two transports, an MPLS or private color and an internet or a public color, right? Obviously I have a vBond, a vSmart and a vManage. Our first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna bring branch two up. So branch two, these lines are dashed because I want branch two to come up online and I want it to connect to both my transports but it's not online yet. <clears throat> the reality is, <clears throat> the reality is the way that we simulate this in a lab is everything is cabled, but the interfaces on branch two's router, it's WAN interfaces are in a shutdown state effectively. And so what we're gonna do is, is simulate this uh, by bringing those up, but we're gonna pre-configure the vManage and the to talk to the vSmart so that when this comes up online, it can just configure itself. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. When we bring up branch two, it's gonna take several minutes. In fact, it's gonna come up and go back down and come up and go back down and then finally come up. Remember I said that there are, uh, there's the ability to have multiple service side VPNs. In this solution, we actually have three service side VPNs, 10, 20, and 40, and all of them by default are fully meshed. That means branch two can talk to every other branch uh, or site directly across any of its transports. So uh, if we have time, we'll also do a policy. And in the policy, what I'll do is I'll uh, force branch two, instead of being able to say, talk directly to branch one, he has to hub and spoke through the data center. There's a couple of different ways to do this actually. Um, and there could be some pretty interesting use cases, especially in things like IoT solutions. And I mentioned before, I was gonna be very uh, transparent and upfront. So every, this is a lab, it's a demo lab. Everything is pre-built. So all these templates, they're pre-built. Uh, all the policies, they're pre-built. It takes too long to go through building all these. Uh, we'd be here way too late. So I don't want to minimize that work. Building out those templates, uh, it takes a lot of work and you'll kind of see when we get in there. Um, but all that work is done up front. Once it's done a single time, you just turn your sites up as quickly as you can get your hardware shipped to the sites, which granted these days with chip shortage, it's hard to get hardware to sites. But still, it's it's that easy. You do all your work up front. Before I hop in the demo, are there any questions about anything I've covered? Every, anything I've covered so far? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's me again. So, yeah. uh, the V bound. So you talked about the V bound that kind of manages the connectivity. Uh, did you mention the V smart in this scenario, or is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did cover it. The V the V Smart is effectively the control plane of the solution. We kind of come back over here. Here's our slide on the V Smart specifically. Uh, there is no uh, there's a control plane on these WAN edges, but it's read only. It's read only because the real control plane is up on the V Smarts. That's why every WAN edge has connections to two distinct v, v smarts so that it never hopefully never loses 
connectivity to its control plane. Obviously, it could still lose connectivity if it uh, loses power. If it only has a single WAN circuit and that WAN circuit goes down, it obviously does lose connectivity to the vSmart. But the vSmart is effectively the control plane. So when we create policies like templates and uh, we attach it to a WAN edge, we do all of our work in vManage. vManage pushes that work down to the vSmart. The vSmart is what actually instantiates that policy down onto our WAN edges. Does that kind of answer your question, Sahil? Understood, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect. Let me get out of slide mode. Okay, can everyone still see my screen okay? I can see it. Hopefully. Okay, perfect. So uh, I've just RDP'd into the server that's running vManage. Here is my vManage right here. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to turn up those WAN interfaces. And this is effectively going through that zero touch provisioning process. Uh, we're going to use a Python script to do it, but we're going to push the change. It's going to go in, bring the interfaces up. But I want to show you real quick, and then we'll come back and really walk through this, because it, it's going to take five, seven minutes. As you can see, I have two vSmarts. I have four WAN edges currently. Uh, this is a lab, so I just have a single vBond and a single vManage. Normally, you would have two and two. But the vManages are not active active, they're active passive, right? So let me just go start the onboarding process because this takes a little bit of time. And then we'll come back and do a little bit of a deeper dive into the interface. Okay. So when you first log in, this is what you see. This is kind of the main uh, interface. So control status, this is basically the different uh, um, ways I'm connecting up to my uh, my vSmarts, okay? You can click, all these are clickable, right? If you want to see your vSmarts, you can click on your vSmarts, right? I've got two of them. Um, these are the system IPs, the sites that they're deployed at. Oops. Some of their different settings. So all of this is um, clickable, right? If you had uh, degraded health on some of your sites, like if you had some that had partial WAN connectivity, you could click there. I don't have any, so it's not clickable. But here, full WAN connectivity, if I click it, <clears throat> you can see I have two devices at the data center one, VH1 and VH2, and I have two devices at branch one, CH1 and CH2. Right, so that's what it means by site health. I have two sites, site data center and site branch one, and all devices are healthy. If the site was completely up, but one of the devices had lost its control plane connection, that would have gone into partial WAN connectivity mode. So all of these are kind of clickable and interactable I don't know if interactable is a word, but it is today. Um, if you're doing, I know a couple of people had mentioned earlier, like uh, some of the voice technology, call manager, uh, call centers, things like that. You can see things like uh, uh, lost latency and jitter right here, right on your main dashboard for these different sites, right? Uh, you have uh, app application aware, this on your router, kind of, you know, a la uh, something like NetFlow. Um, and you can kind of delve into these different applications. A lot of people, if you have a NOC, they may have this up on their NOC, right? Oops. <clears throat> so you can kind of see your different sites and where they're deployed and so forth, right? 
let's come down here. Oh, you know what? I've already goofed up a little bit. I forgot to attach the template. This is the template we need to attach. We click attach devices. This is our device. So we didn't really zero touch provision and that's all my fault. I should have done this part first. I got so excited to, to turn up the interfaces because it takes a while. It pulls this long digits off of our uh, smart account. Okay, so I just move that over here to attach. You can see right now it says, hey, I don't have a system IP or host name. I'm missing a whole bunch of information. So we need to find a way to configure that. You could, you can uh, click in here and you could type over these things. I don't find that, unless you're making a small change or you have a template that just has something very small in it, I don't find the clickability to be a very useful way of doing it. If it's small enough, I may do something like this, which brings up like a web form for me to type in things. More often than not though, I like to save things into a CSV and then upload them. And then it will auto populate all the different fields. I'm gonna hope I didn't goof this up by going out of order. Otherwise it'll be the world's shortest demo. And you can see now that I've uploaded that, it's pre-populated the information for me. It's got a system IP, it's got a host name. I go next, here's the device I'm gonna deploy. It's a little slow. And you, can, you have two tabs up here once you select that device. Here's a preview of the config it's gonna push. If you're making changes, you can also do a config diff, which is very nice for things like change control. Anything in red is coming out, anything in green is going in, or anything in red is changing, I should say. And then I hit configure devices. <clears throat> and it goes out and it starts doing the configuration. When it comes up here and you see this validation success, there's a syntax check that happens as soon as I try to push a config. And what happens is there's a little programming call that goes from the vManage, which I'm logged into right now, down to the vSmart. The vSmart checks all the syntax and says, is what you're asking me to do, is it a valid thing to even do? Uh, because if it's not, I'm going to ignore it. And, it'll be a validation failure. In this case, everything was, I mean, it's a demo, so we're not too surprised probably, but in this case, all the syntax checked out, right? And it's letting you know that this is scheduled because here's all the individual steps. So this will take a few minutes, um, but yeah, probably in about five, six minutes, you'll see I have one that's listed as unavailable. It's because it's going through and trying to configure things right now. Let's come in and take a look at one of those templates real quick, because this is where you spend a lot of your time. These are device templates. That's what I, you know, I did attach device. I attach a device template. These are my feature templates. And you're gonna see there's lots of feature templates. Look at all these feature templates that are in here. Now, part of the reason there's so many of these feature templates is this is a shared demo environment. So it's probably not too surprising that there's lots of people playing around with lots of different templates. If I come to device templates, you can see there's only a few of them. If I actually just go and look at the template itself, this is a device template, right? Well, first of all, you can see what it's built for, right? And then you can see whether it's selected factory default or whether I used a, a custom template, right? So <laughs> all BFD templates, BR2, so this is branch two, OMP basic is a template. These are all individual feature templates. If I click down, well, I'm in, I'm in read only mode. There's nothing for me to click down into right now. So hang on, if I do edit. Some of these I may be able to replace. 
So here you can see uh, I have the option of changing out my feature template, right? I don't want to do that. It's going to break everything. But um, and what's interesting to note, if you change, if you fundamentally change a template that's on, you know, like a feature template, if you swap out one feature template with another, all the devices that are attached to that template will get updated programmatically and automatically. So let's think about something like if you're changing your SNMP strings or your username and password or something like that. If I have 20 devices that are attached to that template, I would just go in, I would change out my SNMP strings and all 20 devices will just get automatically updated all at once, right? So it's kind of a nice way to do operations. It can also be a little nerve wracking because you're making changes to 20 devices at once. So you need to work that through whatever change process you kind of have internally. Um, let's come back to the dashboard and see how we're looking now. I think I talked long enough that now we have an extra device up, right? Here's my WAN edge, it went from four to five. If I click in here, remember everything's kind of clickable. I should see, here we go, here's branch two, V edge one, right? It has a site ID, it has a system IP, I mentioned those, right? It tells you information like what the chassis number is, what version of code it's running, what the serial number is, oops, yeah, et cetera, right? Let's go take a look at our device. Here's our branch two device. We can click into this. And we can start to get some statistics. Now, it just came up. So uh, there's not going to be a ton of great statistics in here, but there's a couple of things I want to point out. <coughs> Control connections. This is usually, so first of all, your first screen when you go into a device, it will give you things like, hey, how do my power supplies look? This is a virtual device, so some of this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but if they're physical devices, it'll tell you things like, do I have a power supply that's faulty or a fan that's faulty or something like that? Do I have a temperature sensor that's going haywire? But when you're first bringing up or first getting used to things, one of the things you always wanna go into is control connections. And this tells me how healthy is my, uh, my fabric. So this is saying I have two transports. The first transport or first color is MPLS. The second transport or the second color is called biz-internet. And you can see I can connect to both of my vSmarts across the MPLS, and I can connect to both of my vSmarts across the biz-internet. Likewise, I'm also connected to vManage across biz-internet, okay? And everything is healthy. Uh, if it turned out I couldn't talk to, you know, one of the vSmarts on one of these transports, it would throw an error here. And so that's why it's a good place to look. And of course you have things like uh, logging in events and alarms in here as well. Let me pick maybe a device that's been up a little bit longer that maybe has some interesting data to go look at. And if I come into, well, let's actually start with applications perhaps. So this does run, I believe it runs S-Flow. And you can see, uh, I booted this uh, demo up around 4 p.m. today, so it's had a little bit of time to run. And you can see it's had some file server traffic that's running kind of in the back end. Um, if I do the last six hours, maybe I'll get some other apps, maybe not, <laughs> just more file server traffic, uh, some web traffic too. I can look at my individual interfaces and it will give me things like throughput, 
packet loss, um, I can see here's all my VPN and BGP information down here. Phys you know, MAC addresses, IP addresses, operational status, all these different things. So, for example, if you're an operational person kind of in the NOC, this device view under uh, monitor and network, it's a great place to kind of hang out and kind of learn about different things. Come into the last hour. This is the interface at the new router that we just uh, booted up. This is branch two, as you can kind of see. I don't know if it will detect any applications yet or not. Yeah, it just hasn't run long enough. It usually takes about 20, 30 minutes for the application data to pick up. Um, top talkers. And we didn't cover any of this because it's kind of like its own demo. But if you're running C edges, so ISRs, ASRs, CAT 8Ks, things like that, you can run uh, a lot of security features on, on them. They can run um, firewalls, they can run uh, IPSs. You can do UR filtering. You can uh, redirect to the umbrella cloud. You have a lot of different options for things like that. So it's no longer a, well, you know, do I need, if I'm, if I'm going to allow people to go to the internet locally, do I need a front end all my SD-WAN devices with a firewall and IPS and proxy and DNS uh, filter? Uh, I mean, you probably want to, right? I would. Uh, but here you can kind of do it in a single box. Um, probably in my mind, the, the most elegant one is the, the umbrella tie-in. Uh, we do that demo a lot when we look at SASE. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the slickest way because you get things like the firewalling, the URL filtering, the decryption all done in the cloud at scale. So it scales really well. Obviously, if you buy a smaller box, it may or may not scale super well. It just, it just depends on kind of how you do that. We're kind of coming up against it. I was going to do a policy uh, demo, but I think maybe we should uh, hold off on that. I, it takes a little bit of time and I don't want people to have to um, stay. You've already given me plenty of time. There are some other dashboards, by the way. You can you can dive into just the VPN dashboard. They have a security dashboard. I don't know if that's configured on this. Oh, a little bit. Yeah, look at this. You can see some of the firewall policies. I haven't actually been in this myself since they upgraded the interface. Um, malware, uh, malware detection, right? Signatures. And uh, I've never seen the multi-cloud one myself. This is kind of new. And oh, I don't think there's any multi-cloud allowed in this particular lab. <clears throat> A couple of things on the monitor, geography gave us our map, network gives us our devices. Alarms are things that your NOC needs to look at. That's things that have gone wrong. Events, I don't find to be very interesting. Events is kind of like informational level logging, right? It's just got all the events, whether they're good, bad, or just normal. So I tend to focus on alarms, especially for the NOC, right? Uh, configuration, we already did the templates. As I mentioned, you can also do the policies here. You can set up specific ones for security. You can see they've got some wizards pre-built for things like doing uh, unified communications, uh, pre-built templates for things like uh, software as a service, infrastructure as a service. And if you don't want to do things like build your own templates and policies, you can use the network design tool, which automates a lot of that. <clears throat> I haven't used it myself yet. It's pretty new, not super new. Maybe it's been out a year or so, maybe a little longer. Um, the last time I saw a demo of it, it was limited, but if you had a fairly simple use case, hey, I have 50 offices and they're all kind of cookie cutter. 
maybe only the headquarters is a little bit different or something like that, then the network design worked really, really well. And you didn't have to goof around with picking your site IDs and your system IPs and stuff. It just took care of all that for you. And it was based off the CVD. If you had a more complex network, um, again, I haven't used it recently, but the network design tool, it was a little iffy for more advanced stuff, right? Tools, you can SSH from the web browser directly into any of these devices on your network. And then you can do things like upload new software images to the repository and then do uh, upgrades and reboots, okay? So, and you can do those in groups. You could say something like, hey, I have my outage window this weekend uh, for the Northeast. So you could uh, upload your image to the repository that all the devices will upgrade to. But then on the software upgrade itself, you could select only the devices in the Northeast. And that's all triggered off of that site ID that we talked about earlier. And then of course, administration, which allows you to do things like add in new users, uh, change out your, um, your CA information, create these VPN groups and colo groups, these are for kind of more advanced routing things and stuff like that. That's kind of the main demo. Like I said, I, I think I'll avoid the uh, policy demo because it takes a little while to kind of get it running because um, you kind of have to show a before and after. But does anyone have any questions or did I miss anything or maybe I went too fast? Okay, that is really the whole whole shebang. Robert, I think we could, well, if there, yeah, there's no questions. I think we could turn off the recording now. You got it.